Uh, tonight, we have uh, Sir Simon Shama, who has written Foreign Bodies, which I encourage you to read. It is a perfectly timed book dealing with pandemics, uh, vaccines, and the health of nations at a time when we're all thinking about getting our flu shots and our COVID boosters and uh, our RSV shots. Uh, but among the many books and things that he has written, you might not be aware of it, I encourage you to think about, is uh, that you might want to explore in the Q&A is uh, why we like tough guys in politics was a subject. And the whole question of, of nature and science and the intersection uh, that takes place and our resistance to new techniques and new, uh, new MAC vaccines and new methods of medical treatment. All are issues that are timely and important and are all are explored in this excellent book called Foreign Pod. Uh, Dr. Sir Simon will be interviewed tonight by Macon Scott uh, from our own Philadelphia's WHYY. She is a specialist in health and science and a host of the show, The Pulse. And so I encourage you to give them both a warm Philadelphia welcome. Hello, everybody. Hi. Thank you for being here. And thank you for being here. I want to start with a small anecdote, and I'll keep it brief. But in 2019, I found myself moderating an event with Dr. Anthony Fauci, who at the time, I have to admit, I was not all that familiar with. And the event was titled, How to Survive a Pandemic. Mm. Everybody was talking about, you know, the 100th anniversary of the flu, right. and pandemics were mm. this big topic. And we had this evening, we talked about all these different pandemics, and not for one minute did it occur to me that I might actually experience a mm. pandemic. I don't know why that didn't register. Mm. And then reading your book, it is so humbling to take this long view mm. of history and to realize there's almost no escaping that. And I don't know right. how we had deluded ourselves into thinking we might. But talk a bit about that long view you took during the pandemic on pandemics. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, you know, repression's a wonderful thing, really. Yes, yes. <laughs> it works. So it, it does work, really. Um, no, I, I think historically, actually, there was one particular um, infectious disease, obviously bubonic plague, which lasted centuries, really, from the 14th century when it arrived in Europe and carried on until the late 17th century. So there was a kind of, um, not just an inherited memory, but people, uh, people's expectations was that this would something that, you know, they would be visited by with absolutely devastating results. Venice lost a whole third of its population in 1631. So, but then the kind of story very often is of sudden and unexpected things coming down the pike. I mean, smallpox, um, which occupies a fair bit of the early part of the book, you know, only really starts to make an impact in Europe. Um, in the late 17th century, and then it really, one in six people die of it suddenly. And rather like COVID-19, um, it induces a sort of spectacularly sudden sense of panic and terror and social disintegration, and um, especially, you know, in, at a time when the immune system was completely unknown and people didn't understand the transmission mm. of pathogens at all. So the sense of what to do and where we were going and the sermons get more incandescent <laughs> and uh, that people are blaming smallpox on the commission of dreadful sins by all and sundry and that sort of syndrome occurs. So very often um, these things happen seemingly um, with startling impact. The other, you know, I I extraordinary moment is uh, is an Asian story, which I which I tell in the book, mm -hmm. when bubonic plague, the Black Death, returns, appearing in Guangzhou, Canton, as it was then, and Hong Kong in 1892. Again, an absolutely fr incredibly frightening frightening thing, and nearly 30 million people die of bubonic plague between the early 1890s and the late 1920s, and that's 
a pandemic, really, we've kind of forgotten yeah. about. So there's a tremendously breathless sense of catching up. The difference between the response to smallpox um, and the response to bubonic plague in the 1890s is that the latter happened after, really, the immune system had been discovered although microbiology had a very hard time persuading the medical profession that it should be taken seriously. Now, to talk about smallpox, what were some of... As we must. Yes, we must. <laughs> <laughs> what were some of the thoughts, now you mentioned sinful behavior being right. a potential cause, what were some <laughs> other thoughts out there? What did people think? How did you get it? How was it spread? What were some of the popular ideas floating around? Well, it, 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 was, it was assumed to be, um, you know, transmitted by some sort of human contact, almost certainly respiratory, which mm -hmm. was, you know. So they had, that, that, that was not, not the problem. Um, it, it, interestingly, um, smallpox did not, however, initiate, trigger the kind of quarantines, really. The, the, mm. the quarantine system that had been adopted in the in the 17th and 16th century was on the assumption, really, that bubonic plague was brought in cargoes. Um, the, the assumption about smallpox, of course, also, there were, uh, the theory of miasma was still very current. Miasma is the sense in which infectious diseases actually are caused by vapors arising from the rotting of organic materials, vegetable materials, um, untended cemeteries, and so on. So the toxins really kind of, you know, rise um, or are caused to their acceler their rise is acceleration to the atmosphere by atmospheric disturbances. You know, uh, made a weather forecast lethal. Um, it, not that there were particular weather forecasts then. The real issue. <laughs> An extraordinary kind of, um, you know, leap in the dark was when, um, you know, I, I, as I describe it, um, it was proposed, um, or it's rather, it was observed by this extraordinary woman, Mary Wortley Montague, the wife of the British ambassador in Constantinople in 1718, um, that though she met particularly women, um, uh, had not suffered from um, smallpox, were, uh, that people didn't die of smallpox, and they weren't, if they survived, disfigured or made to go blind by smallpox. Um, and when on inquiring um, in the seraglios of Pashas and the elite classes of the Ottoman Empire, including the seraglio of the, of the Sultan, she was told that this um, business of inoculation, which later was called variolation, but not in the 18th century, by which you took some poisoned matter, pus, from an infected living body, and transferred it to, into your own arm or head or foot by abrading the skin or making an incision. And this was so staggeringly counterintuitive. Um, she actually inoculated, she was so strongly of the belief empirically acquired that this really would work, that she inoculated her six-year-old son, Edward, when her husband um, was away. I don't think she was particularly confident that he would think this is a good idea. And it worked. He had a mild case of smallpox, um, very few pustules. They all dropped off. Um, her brother had died of it. She'd gone through a catastrophically traumatic case of smallpox. She had been a famous beauty and was badly disfigured by the attack of smallpox. And that was her determination. When she went back to England, she inoculated her three-year-old daughter, at which point um, there was an extraordinary blowback who said, what kind of mother is this that would introduce poison matter into the otherwise perfectly healthy body of their, of their child? And um, if I could interject for a second, it is a gigantic intellectual leap, yeah. as you said, yeah. and counterintuitive. Yeah. So how, how, where can we trace this idea that this might work? Well, ju just, um, you know, it's extra it, again, a fantastically, to me, when I was doing the research on this, an illuminating paradox. Um, on the one hand, um, there's this tremendous belief in empirically accumulated knowledge mm -hmm. um, that, uh, and Mary Butler Montague was not the first to say this. There were two um, Greek physicians, Emmanuel uh, Timoni and Giacomo Pilarini, um, who'd also observed this to be the case. They'd actually seen elderly Greek ladies in the Ottoman Empire 
um, whose profession it was to go around inoculating children in particular. And what, so in some sense there was a respect for um, statistically measurable success um, of what had been empirically seen. The remarkable thing is that the Royal Society, this august, highly elite institution of scientists sitting in London, was prepared to um, entertain and accept these observations and publish them in the philosophical transactions of the Royal Society, even though they came not at all from Western science. They came from Turkey and Syria and India and North Africa. Um, and the famous case when smallpox comes to Boston in 1721, um, Cotton Mather, the Puritan divine, um, gets the information from his enslaved servant, Onesimus. He'd given him that name, as in Onesimus, meaning useful. Onesimus proved extremely useful. And he said, well, in Africa, we've been doing this time out of mind, immemorially. And Cotton Mather took that on. He, he converted one physician, Zabdiel Boylston, and the blowback again was instantaneous. Only God can judge between who will live and who will die. Why should we listen to illiterate barbarians, really, when they tell us what they think is good for us? And a, a grenade was thrown into, um, into, I think, was it Cotton Mathers Parlor? No, it was mm -hmm. Abdiel, was it Cotton Mathers Parlor? Yeah. Um, so there was a real, you know, there was a kind of storm of hatred, yeah. not unlike Fauci phobia now. You know, he gets, yeah. he has to have a security detail and death threats happen pretty much all the time. And there were very public debates over yeah. this issue. If we think about <coughs> Philadelphia, Ben Franklin was right. very opposed in the beginning yeah. to this practice. And then... What I'm did he say? Because actually you reminded me um, and and I uh, hate to say I'd forgotten actually all about yeah, that. Yeah, he did what not did he say believe when he that was objecting? it. Well, he did not believe that it worked. I right. guess people thought it was dangerous, right. that it was not proven, that it could actually kill people. I'm sure it yeah. did kill some people in some instances because I'm sure they didn't always get it right. Well, we, we we'll, we'll never know. I mean, some of right. those who actually in Britain and indeed the great Angelo Gatti in France. Um, said you really have to distinguish between people who um, have died from inoculation mm -hmm. or those who have died after being inoculated. And that is, of course, is still absolutely still the case. Right. Still very contentious. By the way, uh, Michael and I are, are drinking lemonade. Um, <laughs> it, it, I, I was so touched that only the free library would do this. Um, the first person to write in English, actually, as he did, um, for a lay audience about inoculation of smallpox was Voltaire. He'd been in England in 1726-28 and he'd seen inoculation at work and adopted by the royal family, among others. But Voltaire had gone through a horrific case of smallpox um, and at one point he'd, I can't even remember how many, it was like a hundred gallons of lemonade. He attributed his survival <laughs> to that. So just in case there's smallpox lurking, there's some very dodgy characters right at the back, actually. <laughs> but they're all wearing masks, so that's okay. But we have prophylactic lemonade here. Which is but to return... <laughs> cheers to that. To, to return to Ben Franklin, he lost his son yeah. to, to smallpox in 1736. But then he also very publicly changed his mind. Right. And he said, I wish I had done this. Yeah. I wish I had known. Yeah. But I guess sometimes we think of these very political debates over what to do and how to do it. Mm. We think of that as a modern phenomenon, but right. it, is, it is not. I mean, yeah. as long as we've had well, pandemics, they no, have turned quite into true. political I, I, I issues. That's absolutely right. There, there is, there is a, uh, a difference of kind, almost, I think, actually, between the two sets of objections. Um, I mean, in the 18th century, the objections were from uh, a large number, but not all of the clergy. I mean, some of the clergy in Britain in particular, and even occasionally in France, and very notably in Italy, um, move from saying this is uh, an outrageous usurpation of the divine will to saying... Um, uh, really, everything including the mysterious wonder that is inoculation <laughs> has been designed by God, you know. So it's kind of um, wonderful, kind of, I don't know, Spinozist almost, 
version of um, the way the natural world ultimately um, is not inconsistent with heavenly design. But now, what had not happened in the 18th century is this kind of rhetorical fetish about being robbed of our personal autonomy. Um, so the kind of rhetoric of liberty was not really co-opted against the um, wisdom of science, you know, what was held to be the wisdom of science. Um, well, the, the, the 19th century is uh, a moment, really, where um, even though things are extremely politicized, um, but there are real divisions within the medical community and indeed within the scientific community, for example, about whether or not cholera was contagious at all, whether or not cholera only arose in specific localities of where water supplies were fecally contaminated and mm -hmm. therefore could not possibly be contagious. And those who correctly said, well, you're not going to get it if you go into a room with someone who has got cholera, but if you shake hands with him, this may very well be the end. Or, a, 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 you know, even before the cholera, so-called comma vibrio was discovered in 1883, knew really that upholstery on a railway train seat or on a steamship or something like that could would actually carry a microbial pathogen. Talk a bit about the toll cholera took during right. that time period. You gave us a picture of smallpox and just how devastating the impact was. Right. What about cholera? Well, cholera was uh, absolutely as terrifying. I mean, particularly the speed at which mm -hmm. between contracting it and dying of it um, was a matter of, what, two or three days or something like that. It was really absolutely horrifying. So you really did want... Uh, a prophylactic, really. There was not time to for have a kind of mitigating therapy. Um, and I mean, the first, there, there are two stages in the kind of scientific, political, uh, scientific and institutional response. Um, the first stage is the story told in one of the chapters um, of Marcel Proust's father. Uh, this is an extraordinary story. I knew a little bit about him, but not as much as I came to know. Adrian Proust, I knew he was a doctor. I was sort of entertained by that, since he was the father to the most hypochondriac writer in all of <laughs> European literary history, really. Um, but I thought, but, you know, he's sort of a figure of either ominous paternal authority or um, almost absurdly sanctimonious pretentiousness in, in Proust. Although, as I discovered, um, rather movingly, father and son become extremely close towards the end of what would turn out to be the end of Adrian Proust's life. But Proust really... Um, in this kind of tradition of French scientific paternalism that starts in the Ancien Régime and is reinforced both um, towards the end of the Revolution and the period of the Empire and, and in the early 19th century where France sends engineers, scientists and doctors to the Middle East. In, in that tradition, Adrien Proust was, because he was a contagionist, so-called, thought quarantine was absolutely essential. And he travels personally into the hottest of hotspots for cholera on the borders between Russia and Persia in particular. It's an extraordinary story. And then publishes his kind of map of the of the kind of geography of cholera, in effect. The British, of course, sorry to shout, as, um, yeah, as I'm going to when the word British passes my lips. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the, the British, of course, were not keen on this because um, one of the places where cholera was most intensively transmitted and most intensively contagious were on the very, very crowded boats going to the Hajj in Mecca um, from Muslim Asia, from India and Ceylon, Sri Lanka and Malaya and so on. But most of all, the British did not want to see trade interrupted between British Asia and um, the metropolitan home. So there was a tremendous amount of argument, two-part argument. One is that cholera is not contagious. All you have to do is decontaminate and disinfect the sources of its, um, uh, its, it, it, its origins, wherever that was. Um, and um, secondly, you know, and here we do get into kind of the, the way in which kind of classic liberal, um, liberal political philosophy um, colonize public health, um, it, would, it would sort of do no good. The, the, the economic harm you would do, hello, governor of Florida right now, would be much, much worse than the good you could possibly do by quarantine containment. Um, what was not thought to be possible was, um, you know, un until Louis Pasteur 
uh, created a vaccine against rabies was that there would be a prophylactic vaccine against cholera. And that's the story of the sort of hero of the book, really, a man called Vladimir Hafki, an Ukrainian Jew, who manages against all the odds to create um, a successful um, anti-cholera vaccine in the Pasteur Institute in, in the summer of 1892 and then takes it to India. It's an, sort of an extraordinary story. And did they fully understand the causes of cholera at that time? Um, well, yeah, it, it, um, the, the cholera so-called coma vibrio is just discovered. It's isolated and identified by the great um, bacteriologist Robert Cook, in, um, uh, who has a laboratory. The, it's the other pole um, to Pasteur mm -hmm. um, in Berlin. And yes. um, he <laughs> actually isolates the coma vibrio in Alexandria and then in... Um, and then in um, Calcutta. Um, so uh, by the time that Hafkin, it, it, it's known what this um, pathogen looks like, really. Um, and it's also known because of Ilya Metchnikov's work, uh, Ilya Metchnikov's work, um, that there is such a thing as a, um, an immune system, and the immune system can produce what Metchnikov calls um, phagocytes, eating eating cells, in effect, white blood cells. It will produce antibodies, in mm. effect, that will ingest and, um, and actually vacuum clean as well your vascular system of this. So, but they are in the... There's always a lag which can be, um, you know, which we all know about now. There's a, there's, a, there's a lag between scientific breakthrough and the medical profession in particular, the kind of guild mentality of the medical profession taking this on board. Remember that, you know, they were still correctly in debt to Joseph Lister for understanding sepsis and what an antiseptic could do. So then, um, uh, you know, military-style disinfection with carbolic acid and lime wash and so on then became a kind of you know, biblical uh, sort of default <laughs> mode of dealing with any kind of mm. um, any kind of massive outbreak of infectious disease. So it was taken on board, but Hafkin in India was attacked for not having a medical degree, which he didn't. He had a, a doctorate in microbiological science, but it was held his his kind of knowledge was held to be suspicious. Uh, I mean, there have been attacks from people like Rand Paul on the whole discipline of virology as, as dangerous scientists who don't know what they're doing. A lab leak was definitely the origin. I think it was definitely the origin. Um, and they shouldn't be allowed, really, to go gain of function, should not be allowed to happen at all. Without gain of function, um, we wouldn't know what's around the corner in terms of the dangers that the next particular virus might have for mm. us. How was the idea of the immune system received at first? You know, you when you think about um, it, it's almost this war that happens inside of right. your body with the good guys fighting the bad guys and all of this. So right. how did people take to that? Well, um, I, um, you know, the inst major institutions of science do... Um, accept it, actually, mm -hmm. quite uh, as distinct from the medical profession, quite quickly from, you know, Russia through France and Germany and Vienna. And so far um, from there being a kind of um, long delay of um, skepticism, um, what I describe in the book is um, an, a sort of an extension of great power politics in being, uh, uh, you know, they, they send teams of people when bubonic plague breaks out in China. Um, the Japanese, as well as the Germans and the French, again, tellingly, not the British, no, I didn't shout this time, um, <laughs> to China in order to try and isolate the plague bacillus. And a man, an extraordinary man called Alexandre Yersin, Swiss, actually, but um, thought of to his his fury as French, um, but he'd been a, a figure for a while, great figure in the Pasteur Institute, junior. So he isolates it, which is why it's called the Bacillus Yersinii now. And, and so, so they do take it on board, but the issue is actually, um, as always, um, can you get those who need to execute the application to, to, to have the kind of imprimatur of the medical profession. And were these efforts to, to go to these places, to understand what was happening, to mm. find a vaccine, is this 
a humanitarian quest? Is yeah. it more how to protect our own uh, interests here? What were some of the motives? Is all, it the all scientific? Of the, all of the above, Macon. Okay. I think, yeah, I think the one wasn't... Um, it's certainly the case that then, as of now, um, the interest was absolutely in safeguarding your own population, mm -hmm. particularly your colonial power. You know, would this come back to haunt you in your own metropolitan home? Um, but I have to say what was striking about the International Sanitary Conferences and also in the, the crowd of different scientists, and Japanese scientists were very important. In fact, to this day, uh, a, a great scientist called Kichisato Shibasaburo, the Japanese, insists that he was the first person. He probably was by a matter of a week or so to discover the plague bacillus. But... Um, the specimens he'd sent actually were contaminated and therefore they, they were not accepted um, as reliable, whereas Yao-san's were. But, um, but I, my, my point is actually I was struck by the fact that there was probably less suspicion less suspicion, actually, between national scientific communities. There was rivalry and competition, mm -hmm. but the, the differences and conflicts happened over basic theories of pathogenesis. I mean, a very great microbiologist called Pettenkofer in Berlin um, was a kind of rival of Robert Koch, and he still insisted that even though he accepted the existence of pathogenic microbes, um, and viruses and bacteria and bacilli and so on. He also insisted that whether or not they would be lethal depended on atmospheric disturbances or <laughs> swampy ground. And, you know, yeah, we, you're quite right. You know, we laugh at that now, actually, but he was such a kind of institutional, thought of as an institutionally wise figure. That so, so those were, those were the battles that being fought out intra-scientifically, really. Mm -hmm. um, but people, people were, you know, again, the possibility of achieving immunity through vaccination um, was, was, you know, was taken on board surprisingly, I think, mm -hmm. actually. Which is not to say that when things might go wrong, um, the kind of sudden reaction against it, which we, you know, see now. I mean, for example, I don't think things are going wrong with the COVID vaccines, but it is quite true that as a prophylactic, as you get a vaccination and you will never get COVID, we all know that's not true. Um, many of you, I'm sure, have had both, <laughs> as I have. Um, what is absolutely indisputably true is that vaccination is an incredible mitigator of severity. Of that there is no statistical doubt whatsoever. Um, so, in, in, a, in a sense, there's often a kind of moment of catch-up mm -hmm. and correction and modification. I want to turn to one of the big figures in your book, which is Waldemar Hafkin, and his role in, in finding the cholera vaccine. So right. talk a bit about his background. Right. How did his scientific journey start? Right. Where did it take him? Yeah, it's a, he is a remarkable figure, and I've been accused quite correctly by reviewers of being a bit too much in love with him. I, there's an incredible <laughs> photograph. Two photographs are taken at the height of his uh, fame in 1899. Um, by a very interesting woman photographer called Angelina Ackland, who was the daughter of the Emeritus Professor of Pathology at Oxford. And um, he's, he is strikingly handsome, and she makes him even more in the way she photographs him. So I begin that chapter with, goodness, isn't he beautiful, or something like that. <laughs> Me not meaning that I am, you know, merrily in love. I probably am a bit, but um, meaning that she and people who saw Hafkin in person absolutely felt, you know, beautiful on the outside, beautiful on the inside. Uh, but Hafkin was, he was a, an Odessan Jew, a Ukrainian Jew, um, born indeed, grew up in Odessa, which had a history of pogroms um, from the 1870s onwards. Um, it, was not a, it, was, it was not a secular family, it was not a super orthodox family. Odessa was one of the very few places where Jews could go to university and receive a professional training um, and were taught Russian. Um, and learned in Russian as well. Interestingly, the Hafkin, he had a grandfather who taught him Hebrew and religion. So they, they were neither irreligious nor um, certainly not super orthodox. He goes to the so-called Nova Russia University in Odessa, the new, new Russian university, um, in, um, in 1880-81 um, to read maths and physics. 
Um, and that is the year which you'll, some of you, I'm sure, will know that Tsar Alexander II was assassinated by um, a terrorist, mostly student organization called Narodio Volia, the People's Will. And um, Hafkin was certainly not part of that assassination plot, um, but a young Jewish woman was. And the assassination of the Tsar was blamed on the Jews. And even though Odessa was a place where um, you know, a fairly enlightened place for Jews to live. Um, they knew another very bad pogrom was coming down the line. And Hafkin was part of a group of Jews who armed the community with guns for the first time. Um, they also, because um, they knew a pogrom would happen, um, and <laughs> rather wonderfully, um, I think, um, the, the, the little group of students went to the toughest of the tough in the Odessa Jewish community to kind of mobilize them into an armed self-defense group. And that would be kosher butchers. You know, you really don't <laughs> want to mess with them. My grandfather was one of them, Mark, actually. <laughs> and you know, they had their own synagogue, actually, in which um, Hafkin's best friend preached a sermon. So Hafkin is caught with a gun on him three times and thrown into the slammer. And he's rescued by his doctor father, Metchnikoff himself, who gets the Nobel Prize for his work in immunology, really for discovering how the immune system works. Metchnikoff is from a converted Jewish family, but he has great connections among the super few plutocratic Jews in Petersburg and through them to the court. And he's sprung from prison, although the secret police in Russia start to compile what becomes a very weighty file on this young man. In the end, Mechnikov's own career is compromised by helping Hafkin, among other things, and Mechnikov's own sense of what, uh, suspicion about the Okhrana, the secret police in Russia. And Mechnikov tells Hafkin, um, do science, you have to stop politics. And when Mechnikov goes to the Astu Pasteur in its first year in 1888-89, um, he ends up bringing Hafkin there. Um, and Hafkin is a devotee of French. I mean, he's, he's, he's versatile in many languages. And it's 1889, it's the centennial of the French Revolution. The Eiffel Tower is built. Um, he's in love. He, it's, his notebooks, the archives are in Jerusalem, and they are just a wonderful thing. Um, his notebooks are full, on the one hand, of elaborate preparatory notes for the world's first experimental course in microbiology taught by Pasteur's um, second-in-command, Emil Roux. And on the other hand, lengthy passages from the novels of Balzac and short stories by Maupassant and poems by Verlaine and so on. So it's really absolutely amazing. And he is given, he's a lowly worm, he's an assistant librarian, there's no place for him. So he does his preparatory scientific work during the day, but he then is, you know, he, he decides that he will do what was thought to be impossible, namely um, apply the kind of methodology that Pasteur had used to create a, rabi a, a vaccine against rabies um, to cholera, and it takes him two and a half years and endless false starts, and through a, a complicated series of serial passages through guinea pigs, 39 of them to be precise, producing the kind of, uh, I mean, it's a very delicate thing. You needed enough of the, uh, of the pathogen to kickstart the immune system. He knows how the immune system works, but not enough that it's going to kill you. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so pretty much smallpox, but now intelligently based on, on the scientific groundwork. And then in July 1892, he's got what he wants, and it's working in, a, in guinea pigs and a variety of animals. In other words, they're subcutaneously... Um, injected with the vaccine, and they don't, and they've also been given in a different part of their body a dose of cholera, and they don't die of it at all. Um, and then he does, and it's a very important part because actually, you know, it's all about success at persuasion, it's about communication. Um, he, he is the first person to vaccinate himself, and then he rounds up 
some friends who you have to say must have been very friendly to want to try this. And there's a young new friend who's an Englishman called Ernest Hanbury Hankin, who's a kind of wonderful figure. And Hankin follows every single step of the procedure and the research, experimental research that had gone to make it and publishes it in the British Medical Journal. Um, and, um, and it's done. And, but what is not done um, is that cholera is receding fast. It's not completely gone. There's another outbreak in famous one in Hamburg in 1896, I think it was. Um, but um, everybody in the Pasteur Institute knows that you need to go to a population where cholera um, it can be a sudden epidemic, and that would be in Asia and in India. And so he goes there. When they vaccinated themselves, yeah. I mean, they were, they were not exposed to cholera at that time. So they were testing it more to sh see that it was safe, or what was the um, thinking? Well, uh, you know, they were, they were exposed in, to the extent in which they're introducing it into their perfectly healthy bodies, the right. same way that inoculation and vaccination, cow vaccination, worked. So, um, and uh, I will say that what I've not said yet, and I say in the book, is that Hafkin isn't exactly the first person to do it. There was, mm -hmm. um, yeah, a Catalan, um, so self-taught scientist um, um, and Dr. Gorjame Ferran, um, who tries it in Spain, um, and uh, but she doesn't do any kind of randomised trials, which Hafkin knows he must do. That's why he wants to go to India to do it. And um, oh, there's a particularly terrible moment where Ferran in um, vaccinates. Um, a convent of nuns, and about a third of them die, mm. and one, and also the son of a friend of his dies of it. So, Hafkin going on was well aware of this and knew that you know when he um, vaccinates himself, <laughs> it's an incredible throw of the dice, um, and his friends knew that as well. But he was, you know, all those midnight work with the guinea pigs and. Um, and the confirmation of results. It was really exhaustively... I mean, I will say this, you're getting... There's actually a very nice review forthcoming at some point in the in New York Times, but I saw the text today. But uh, amidst the... Um, it's a, some snarky things, but hey, you take... you get. But the extraordinary thing is that the reviewer says, Hafkin home-brewed the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Um, he said it was sort of homemade vaccine, which sounds like he's making it in his bathtub or something. He is, in fact, obeying the most rigorous protocols of modern, you know, microbiology. So, yeah. um, so he he goes through the most exacting standards he, he can possibly do, and then when he gets to India, um, he has what he wants. In other words, he has. Only volunteers got the vaccine in India, but they were in Calcutta slums, they were in very poor parts of India, or they were in military cantonments, or even in prisons. So he can do what we now recognize as randomized trials. In other words, person A gets the vaccine, person B doesn't, person C gets the vaccine, and so on. So, and whatever the British um, in India were guilty of, which was plenty, they were not guilty of under-collecting data. Mm -hmm. So, uh, me sitting in lockdown in the Hudson Valley, um, it's absolutely a courtesy of the Welcome Collection and government records in Britain, um, could read all these extraordinarily detailed, sometimes street by street, house by house records of how the vaccine worked or how, in some cases, it didn't work. Mm. Are there any secrets or tips to writing well and profoundly about so many different topics? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. It's a lovely question, but um, everybody will, you know, give you their own answer. It's very kind of you to uh, assume that's that's what I do or to characterise me in that way. Um, I, I, you know, um, the last thing my father ever said to me before he died is, be brave. And I think what he meant by that, and he'd seen two of my books come out, um, I think what he meant about it is, you know, follow your star in some sense. Do not, um, if you're a non-fiction writer, do not necessarily um, obey the conventions and don't just talk inside the echo chamber of academia. Nothing wrong with, with scholarly discussion. Absolutely do it a lot and it's to be commended. But... Um, you know, sometimes different subjects, for example, I mean, um, 
you know, sort of I've written on, on, on many different things, but in many, I, I now see, and I, I don't think I was consciously trying to really adopt a different kind of voice, but the different kind of voice adopted me. In other words, the voice in the book I wrote about the French Revolution, Citizens, there I suppose I was a little conscious of that. Um, I, I, I'd given lectures on the French Revolution in Cambridge a lot, but I was really interested in Dutch history, but particularly the, the moment when the French Revolution invaded the Netherlands in the name of granting them liberty. Um, but it was a, a wonderful publisher at Penguin who said you really should be, as the bicentennial approach, said you should be writing such a book. And I thought, mm, should I? And what I did was actually go and read, um, I, I in any case immersed myself and, you know, in my own peers and contemporaries' work on the French Revolution. I went and read what had been written and published in the centennial of the French Revolution in 1889 by people whose parents or grandparents had, uh, had, had been alive, more or less, at the time or shortly after. And there, I, um, that's why I call it a chronicle of the French Revolution. There, I, I wanted somehow, without abandoning analytical argument, I wanted to get the kind of diction, in a way, um, and that led me to the to understanding the importance of rhetoric itself, different manners of speech as a kind of inflammatory weapon in in revolutionary politics. Um, so that was one case. Um, in another case, the book I wrote about called Rough Crossings about the um, enslaved people in America who were cynically promised by the British their freedom if they joined the British army, the Loyalist army, and 10,000 10, of them did. Um, it's an extraordinary story. Um, I wouldn't have written that book had I not encountered the journal in the New York Historical Society, the young 27-year-old um, lieutenant, who was a brother of the abolitionist Thomas Clarkson, so the young man is called John Clarkson, who took it upon himself to gather these um, black loyalists who were very badly treated by British white loyalists in Nova Scotia after the war was over, and take them across the ocean, hence the title of the book Rough Crossings, to found what became Sierra Leone. So it was the, the gripping sense, really, of that one document that made me sort of be, want to be a kind of historical ventriloquist for John, Clark, John, John Clarkson. So each task really comes with its own sensibility, I think, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you just sort of have to be open to cultivating that if you can. Go with the flow. I was wondering, is it known if in ancient times and biblical times biblical there times. were epidemics such as you've been describing in, or in your book? And then I have a little second part. Well, it, um, that's a lovely question. It's um, the, the certainly, um, you know, the first famous descriptions of um, what is clearly a bubonic plague um, occur in the 6th century AD, as it were, CE, in, in the reign of the Emperor Justinian. And recently there have been attempts to actually discredit the possibility that it really was now. But we, there have been counter attempts, which are much more convincing that there really was a very, very serious outbreak of, of, of plague in the 6th century AD, CE. Um, the Bible is a very, um, very difficult source because most of it is written many hundreds of years after the events it purports to describe. And it depends on how you read your Hebrew. You know, there are clearly, it describes leprosy, for example. Um, what, you know, when the plague of Egypt is, plagues of Egypt, they are, you know, there's cattle, my rain, and boils, and frogs, and so on. You can't develop an etiology from the Bible. It's just... It's a beautiful, beautiful thing, but it's a staggering exercise in poetic license and invented memory, really. So what is the difference between an epidemic and a pandemic? Oh, well, it's a uh, yeah, very good question, which I've never really been able to figure out. Pandemic just means everywhere, really. An epidemic can occur within a circumscribed area, even it's, if it's as big as India. But usually it's described in a more circumscribed yeah. area. Pandemic is exactly what we've been through with COVID, where from one end of the world to the other, um, it happens. Or so in a very, very large, so that's semantic difference, I think, to, of order of magnitude, really, and geography. As you've been 
exploring and te retelling these stories of so many epidemics and pandemics, whether you have seen whether there's some particular dimension that leads to forgetfulness, if you will, or that no, leads to what? Sorry, leads leads forget, us to oh, yeah. forget oh, about yeah. these for them yeah. to us to disappear from our minds, even as we walk in cities now that right. two years right. ago were empty. Right. Whether there's something as you as you look across this history that seems to be a particular dimension, either the scale of death, the yeah. nature of transmission, other features that, that yeah. speak to that. It, no, that's a wonderful question. Um, uh, the, the, the classic, if that's the right word to call it, of um, the Black Death, you know, begins in 1348 famously and does not really end until the late 17th century. And in fact, um, well, more accurately, it doesn't really end until 1722, 23, when there's a terrible outbreak of the Black Death in Marseille. I mean, a really terrible outbreak. Um, but that's a lot of centuries. Um, and the plague releases its grip for two or three years, and then it will pounce horrifically. In England in 1665, Venice lost a third of its population in 1630-31. It was catastrophic beyond belief. Um, but there's a constant, you know, from Boccaccio through to Daniel Defoe's novel, Journal of the Plague Year, there is a kind of, uh, there's the sort of a level of cultural expectation of living with or, or trying to escape from the Black Death. Other epidemics and pandemics um, have a much more kind of compressed lifespan. I mean, cholera begins in earnest, in Europe at least, in 1819, and is sort of going away in the 1880s, really, 1890s. That's a long time, I suppose, but it's, it's far less long than the experience of Black Death. So, there is, there is, I mean, well, if you take the so-called Spanish flu, which began in Kansas, by the way, <laughs> as far as we know, um, you know, it's natural human instinct to want not to be terrified. Repression is a great and wonderful thing. Um, but, of course, the scientific community, what we, you know, there were the, I, I haven't read it yet, the transcript, but um, uh, Hebre Jesus, the head of the World Health Organization, gave a press conference today about preparations for future pandemics. The, we now have an extraordinary community worldwide of epidemiologists and virologists and um, who are doing nothing else but thinking about, actually, um, what to do on the expectation that something else unpleasant is going to be coming down the pike. And the early part of the book is, is sort of, I suppose, not quite of a piece with the rest of the book, but the very first chapter is about an ongoing huge problem, namely the destruction of the barriers between wild animal populations and densely inhabited human populations, um, which has led to the transmission of extremely deadly Ebola and AIDS and H1N1 and, you know, some contained like Ebola, AIDS not, all coming through that particular route. And we're in a time of kind of demographic explosion. So that the reason, one of the reasons why um, the normal barriers um, have gone down. It also includes the extraordinary explosion in the trading of wild animals for pseudo-pharmaceutical purposes or just for bushmeat. Um, this, this goes on and on. As uh, populations in big cities like um, Lagos in Nigeria, for example, Johannesburg in South Africa, push against reservoirs of wild animal populations, the dangers you know, become more and more serious and more and more aggravated. And um, uh, it's not that the scientific community is not paying attention to it. They, they, they are, but um, they run up against all the economic and political barriers and misgivings that you can well imagine. Like, it's just like, you know, the, the link between climate change, I mean, for example, climate change is extending the breeding season of mosquito populations that, that carry dengue fever and, and West Nile virus. And um, uh, on the other hand, you know, um, within the next few years, if not sooner, there will be a vaccine against malaria, which would be an incredible thing, mm -hmm. I think, really. Yeah. Um, I was saying to Macon, I mean, we're in this extraordinary moment 
Um, it's a very free library of Philadelphia moment where the human condition is one of staggeringly unprecedented technical ingenuity. And at the same time, we're just a kind of cartload of barely evolved paranoias, prejudices <laughs> as well. <laughs> we're stuck with this split personality. Could you talk about the history of blaming it on foreigners? I mean, it seems to be kind yeah. of a, a theme. Um, certainly it's happened in, in this in this go round, but is, does that yeah. happen all the time? And the anti-Semitism. Right. Well, yeah. well fa uh, certainly Hafkin was constantly described, particularly when he, um, he, 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 he hits a terrible wall in that in, he's the person who creates the first, the world's first mass production vaccine facility in Bombay, as it was then known in 1899. And this produces millions of doses of vaccine which travel all through India um, and even beyond India to Africa and Malaya, as it was then, Australia and so on. But in 1902, there's a case... I'm going to come to your question, I promise, in a second. Um, but there's a case of... a terrible case in a village in the Punjab called Malkawal, um, where 19 people die of typhus, uh, of typhus, of tetanus poisoning, um, as a result of a contaminated batch of vaccine. And um, uh, Hafkin immediately gets the blame, even though the commission of inquiry, without telling him, knows that what had actually happened in the village was that the person, one of the preparers of the vaccines, had dropped for, the forceps that were used to extract the India rubber stopper from the neck of the bottle, the vial, had been dropped on the ground. All these vaccinations in rural districts happened in the open air. And instead of passing it through heat sterilization, the Anstu Pasteur norm had merely sluiced the forceps in a dilute um, preparation of carbolic acid, and that's where the contamination happened. Hafkin did know, however, um, that if, in fact, the contamination had happened at source in the production facility in Bombay, when the bottle was opened, it took two or three weeks to get to this particular place in the Punjab, there would have been a terrible, violent stench of odour characteristically happen with the growth of tetanus uh, toxins. And no one, had, no one had smelled anything at all. Mm -hmm. So he was kind of convinced that it had not been his fault. But, and here's the answer, he's instantly thought of as the Russian Jew, the double, double penalty there. The Russians are thought by the British at the end of the 19th century to be massing uh, above the Khyber Pass with ill intention, about to pour down into the Valley of the Indus. And he is indeed an outsider. He has no medical degree. He's Jewish. He's a stranger. He's socially awkward. All those things do come into play to such an extent that the Viceroy, Lord Curzon, um, blames blames um, Hafkin for bringing the the, the uh, honour and integrity of the British Raj into disrepute, and says he needs to be tried, convicted, and hanged for what he's done to British India. So that indeed, and um, that sort of sense of suspicion of Jewish doctors goes back a very very long way to the Middle Ages. Um, the University of Padua was one of the few places where Jews could go and get, again, a degree in medicine um, in the high Christian Middle Ages. And they were thought of, you know, Maimonides was known about. Jewish doctors at the end of the Middle Ages in the early modern period were thought of as possessors of esoteric and occult knowledge, um, particularly about anti-venom secrets, antidotes to poisoning. And poisoning is big business, if you know your Borgia history and history of the <laughs> Renaissance. So Jews are hired as super doctors, but they're also thought to be super dangerous. And famously, a Murano doctor, physician to Queen Elizabeth I, was accused of being part of a Spanish plot to poison her and was tried and executed for that. And so you live on kind of razor's edge of special favor because of your advanced and semi-secret knowledge of medical, medical things which non-Jews were not supposed to know about. And this is all spurious for the most part, this access to secret knowledge. It meant knowing Arabic very often. Um, and um, uh, between success and paying a terrible price. And I think in, you know, that then feeds into modern paranoias as well. Not just for Jews. Too. But that's why the book is called partly 
punningly, in a rather lead-booted way, foreign bodies. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you so much for spending the evening with us. Thank you. And Thank you for coming.